If you're like us and you enjoy wasting time on the internet, you're probably well aware of patent medicines. According to the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, patent medicines were first produced as special remedies in England in the late 17th century, with letters patents granted by the royal crown to give monopolies to the manufacturers. In time, people started using the phrase patent medicines to refer to any over-the-counter drug. American colonists, inspired by British druggists, began peddling their own patent medicines and the cure-all, instant-fix craze reached its peak from about 1850 to 1900. Many patent medicines are easy targets for humor thanks to dangerous ingredients like heroin and morphine. Things changed a bit after the US government cracked down with the Food and Drugs Act in 1906, and you started seeing products like baby medicine with a label touting the fact that it contains no opiates. Suddenly, relative safety became a selling point. And, in fact, the use of harmful ingredients early on had created a whole new market for more patent medicines that purported to cure people of the addictions that they had developed from the previous patent medicines. For the most part, however, this video is not about those kinds of patent medicines. It's about the ones with the most bizarre names and backstories that we could find. The ones that you don't hear that much about. Number 10. Uncle Ben Joe's Bell Tongue Syrup Let's dive right in with a concoction that sounds and looks like it was kind of dreamed up by a crazy man deep in the sticks of South America. It sounds and looks like that because it was. Uncle Ben Joe, whoever he was, hit the market in the 1870s with a wondrous potion called Bell Tongue Syrup, which he reportedly derived from the Andean Bell Tongue plant, whatever that was. Bell Tongue Syrup, as prepared by our fearless bald and bearded hero, not me, could cure most anything affecting a human in the 19th century. From the bottles laid we learn that flatulency, brain diseases, tumors, and even epilepsy could all be positively reversed with no more than half a teaspoon taken thrice daily. Just for good measure, the label threw in general debility to make sure every ailment under the sun was covered. For several years, issues of the American Agriculturalist featured the rants of editors who'd been bombarded with reader letters about quack medicines and were sick of it. The September section of Volume 32 from 1873 sarcastically describes dear old Uncle Ben Joe and states that no botanist ever saw anything like his so-called bell tongue plant. A year later, and probably a good deal more frustrated, the editors called the subject shallow nonsense. Then, in the 1876 issue, they celebrated the fact that for months nobody had come forward with the next great medicinal remedy that would heal everyone from everything. Hopefully they enjoyed their brief respite because there were still a lot of years worth of dubious patent medicines ahead of them. Number 9. Zoophora now we turn to Zoophora, formerly called Dr. Pengelly's Women's Friend. This helpful product was brewed up in Kalamazoo, Michigan for all forms of female weakness, and was a hit for a few decades starting around 1870. According to the October 2010 Kalamazoo Antique Bottle Club news, it contained enough alcohol to qualify as liquor. But the interesting part here isn't the alcohol, it's the fact that Dr. Pengelly's wife, Mary, was a key player in Kalamazoo's Christian temperance movement. Perhaps she was not such a big fan of her husband's woman's friend. A treasure hunter dug up a lead printing plate for a 19th century Zoophora advertisement and later was able to locate an ad that it had been used to print in an 1882 edition of the Marshall Statesman. It turns out it offered three glowing reviews of the remedy slash booze, one of which claimed total relief from 16 years of spasmodic headaches and nervous exhaustion in less than two hours. What Zoophora won't do for womankind, no medicine will, boasts an ad from the Ann Arbor Argus in 1895. Sure thing, Doc. Number 8. Dr. Shoop Green's Salve Clarendon I. Shoop has a good thing going in Racine, Wisconsin, with a little business he called Dr. Shoop's Family Medicine Company, later Dr. Shoop Laboratories. Green Salve, an ointment for the lips and skin, was one of many remedies and cures Shoop sold with great success at his medicine shop. Imagine for a moment smearing yourself with some random green stuff made by a dude called Shoop. I mean, who in the world wouldn't want to do that? It was advertised as making lips and skin like velvet. Further stating, to have beautiful pink velvet-like lips, apply at bedtime a coating of Dr. Shoop's Green Salve. 
This appeared in an ad in a 1906 edition of the Tazewell Republican, although honestly we would expect our lips to turn green instead of pink. As did many makers of patent medicine, Shoop relied on aggressive advertising to promote his products, at one point partnering with copywriting legend Claude C. Hopkins for a nationwide direct mail campaign. But the thing that set Shoop apart from many of the patent medicine pushers of his day – read quacks here – was the fact that he was actually a physician. Even though some of his products did contain alcohol and marijuana and the occasional poisonous plant, for the most part he legitimately wanted to help people feel better and tried to avoid addictive ingredients. Dr. Shoop all along has bitterly opposed the use of opiates or narcotics – reads another cure-all ad for his cough syrup in that Republican issue. Number 7. Moses Dame's Wine of the Woods In case just hearing the words Moses Dame's Wine of the Woods didn't strike fear into the hearts of men, the Moses Dame Company of Danbury, Connecticut made sure to include an illustration on its bottles confirming that yes, this here beverage was brewed in a haunted fen and it will likely make you crazy. No meat in this medicine, it's a purely vegetable remedy for all diseases arising from derangement of stomach, liver, or blood. One dollar a bottle, six for five dollars. Drink first and ask questions later, assuming you're still alive. The Moses Dame Company was, beginning in the early 1870s, presided over by a certain Isaac Ike Ives, a member of the highly influential Ives clan that owned and operated a smattering of successful small businesses in Danbury over the years. Ike was a bit eccentric. He once gave a speech before the entire town, pretending to be the traveler and lecturer George Francis Express train when the latter failed to show up at the appointed time. Ike apparently fooled the whole crowd. Where did you buy your lumber? Someone once asked, as reported by the local newspaper in 1874. The response from Ike, from that crazy fellow at White Street Bridge. Maybe he had been drinking too much of his own medicine. Number 6. Clark Stanley's Snake Oil Liniment the original snake oil salesmen were exactly what the name says – people with bad intentions hawking various healing oils and remedies supposedly made with actual snake oil. This particular practice was just another instance of Americans taking something legit from another culture and ruining it. In this case, they ruined the snake oil remedies brought from Asia by Chinese laborers working on the Transcontinental Railroad. The Chinese had actual snake oil medicine that truly helped fight inflammation. It was made of oil from the Chinese water snake. But but as the Chinese water snake did not exist in the US and therefore could not be exploited by injudicious Americans, injudicious Americans simply went after something else – the rattlesnake. Cure-all companies and entrepreneurs began harvesting these innocent serpents for medicine during the 19th century. One man in particular stood out for his particularly daft antics – that's Clark Stanley, who called himself the Rattlesnake King. Stanley made a name for himself at the 1893 World's Columbian Expo in Chicago by murdering a bunch of snakes before a crowd, boiling them, and using the fat to mix up a liniment right on the spot. He described it as a wonderful, pain-destroying compound. Except, as by now you've certainly guessed, it was all just showmanship. Aside from maybe those few batches made in Chicago, Clark Stanley's snake oil liniment had exactly 0% snake oil. It also totally didn't destroy pain. A decade after the Food and Drugs Act, the feds finally got around to investigating this Stanley character and they fined him $20 for falsely and fraudulently representing his product. Thanks in part to the efforts of Stanley and the other snake oil salesmen, we now have a fine metaphor for referring to to men and women of dishonest caliber. Number 5. Fettle Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Fettle, a superior tonic for the stomach and ethical and efficable preparation. The foe of indigestion and the ally of good health. And yes, it makes you feel like a fighting cock too. It's basically everything a decent American would need to dash through the roaring twenties and then pass out on the steps of the Great Depression. The Gettysburg Times from December 21, 1920 has an excellent piece of medical advertising titled, When Off Your Feed, It's the World's Stomach, Not Its Heart That's Suffering. This proposes fennel as the final fix for the evils of indigestion. When you're fagged out, off your feed, and your digestive apparatus fails to function properly, you can trace the troubled indigestion. This is a bad situation, the ad said, but definitely not your fault. And also, did you know that in such a condition, poisonous substances are being forced into your blood and your whole system is susceptible to attack by disease germs? Fortunately, though, there is fettle for you, which you are going to need if you plan on surviving the 12 days
days of Christmas with the in-laws, not to mention life in general. Fettel is not a beverage. The label is careful to clarify. Not a substitute for alcoholic stimulant. Four lines later, we find the warning. Alcohol content 52% by volume. Yup, that'll do it. Number four, Kendall's Spavin Cure for Human Flesh. Now, with this one, you might be thinking something along the lines of, well, what exactly is wrong with human flesh, and why do I need to be cured from it? It seems to be working pretty fine. Also, what's Spavin? Well, Merriam-Webster defines Spavin as a swelling, especially a bony enlargement, of the hook of a horse associated with strain. Considering Kendall's Spavin cure by itself, then we have a medication for a horse's swollen hind leg joint. The human flesh part comes later. In the case of Dr. B.J. Kendall and his namesake Enosberg Falls Vermont Company, this patent medicine was marketed as a cure for various ailments in racehorses and in humans. Human flesh simply indicates that the bottle was intended for people. One ad specifies that the cure has been refined expressly for human flesh in red wrappers, in light wrappers, for animals, that in light wrappers can be used with perfect safety on human flesh if desired. Kendall himself did not do so well financially in the long run, but his company thrived in small town Ennisburg and was influential enough for the local semi pro baseball team to borrow his name, the Ennisburg Falls Spraven Curers. Number 3. Marshmallow Health Pearls. James May of Norgata, Connecticut established the Diamond Laboratory Company sometime in the late 19th century and started bottling ginger ale as well as manufacturing a variety of delightful marshmallow-themed preparations. May is the man you can thank for marshmallow health pearls and later May's health pearls. May's sweet little balls were marketed as the best remedy known for biliousness, sick headache, constipation, and all liver, stomach, and bowel troubles. And these little cathartic pearls were reliable, or at least deliciously charming enough to last more than 20 years on the patent medicine market, and no medicine could survive that period without real merit, according to Diamond Laboratory Co. Diamond Lab's cash cow, however, was apparently a different sugary bliss beverage called marshmallow cream. Number 2. 666 Salve Monticello Drug Company spent more than a century manufacturing and marketing its line of 666 products for colds, coughs, aches, and pains to customers across the country, even the ones who made fun of it for literally branding itself with the mark of the beast. Deuce of Clubs had a jolly time of things in 1994, pestering a customer service rep with questions and then writing a funny piece about it. This action resulted in a complaint from certain humorless persons at Monticello, and then later an apologetic and positive follow-up comment from the president himself. In the process, we learned how the company decided to adopt its end-of-days name. As told by Monticello, the story goes back to 1908 in the company's beginnings. At that time, in Jacksonville, Florida, Monticello was just getting started and managed to produce a successful quinine medicine for fever and malaria. The medicine worked out, and as fate would have it, the number on the very first order was written 666. People started asking for that 666 product, and Monticello, recognizing an opportunity to sell its soul to the devil for a hundred years of business success, decided to slap 666 on other products too. Their advertising road for minor cuts and sores we know of no finer dressing than 666 Salve. Number 1. Dr. Fuller's Electrospiral Magnetic Vegetable Vapor Cure Uncork bottle and inhale vapor until the head is clear. The effect is magical, giving instant relief. Price $1. Then all you had to do was put the cork back in the bottle and slap yourself in the face a few times, because if inhaling the vapors of a perfectly magnetized vegetable compound really kicked this much diseased ass, then your mind has conjured a false reality and you need to get out fast. The National Museum of American History notes that this product was made from 1888 to 1906. But no matter if you go and wander the few aisles of vitamins and over-the-counter drugs at your favorite big box or convenience store, you'll find out that we're all still crazy. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, I've got another channel called Biographics that is linked to below. Go check it out if you want biographies of notable people from history. And as always, thank you for watching.